Uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Eric Ortiz and I'm the president of the Lowry Hill East Neighborhood Association, or LENA. Thank you for joining us for this LENA talk with Chriselle Schell, the Assistant Executive Director of the Minnesota Peacebuilding Leadership Institute. She will become the Executive Director of Peacebuilding Leadership Institute on January 1st, 2022. She also is a racial healing talking circle group leader for the local Coming to the Table program. During this LENA talk, Chriselle will provide insight into the work she is doing to help unify and strengthen our community in Minneapolis and the ways in which we all can work together to create a just and truthful society that acknowledges and seeks to heal racial wounds. Before we get started, I just want to review Lena's online code of conduct. Lena is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that represents the Minneapolis community of Lowry Hill East, also known as the Wedge. We welcome discourse, and, but we ask that everyone here be respectful when they speak or comment on Zoom and Facebook. Please respect the views of others without personal attacks. We also ask that you leave yourself on mute unless called on. If your comments are in violation of our online policy, a moderator will give you a warning. If your comments continue to violate our online code of conduct, you will be removed from the talk. Deliberately unmuting and causing a disruption, cursing, or the use of hate speech will lead to immediate removal. Nasise Galetta is a Lena community coordinator and she will be our moderator tonight. Uh, we also are gonna be live streaming this on Facebook and we're looking forward to a great talk. This Lena talk is sponsored by two companies, Beco Becoming Machinic and Sortilage. Becoming Machinic creates business process automation solutions for legacy IT environments on site and in the cloud for the small to mid-sized businesses. Sortilage is a game design and development company focused on using games to help us better understand our world. Jordan Peacock is the CEO and co-founder of Becoming Machinic and the founder of Sortilage. He's gonna tell us a little bit about more, uh, a little bit about both companies. Uh, Jordan. Thank you, Eric. Although uh, I think you did a great introduction, so I don't know that the companies need any comment, but I'll mention a little bit about myself and why I'm excited to have sponsored this talk. Uh, my name is Jordan Peacock. I am also on the Lena board. I'm currently the secretary. I uh, live locally here in Lower Hill East. I'm really ex excited for Chriselle's talk and uh, her work with the Minnesota uh, Peace, Peace Building Leadership Institute. Um, I actually am not from America originally. I'm Canadian originally, and I grew up in Kuwait. And I went through the process of becoming a citizen and, and building these companies. And it's just really exciting for me to uh, you know, build not just the companies, but building the community through the work with Lena and people like Eric and people like Chriselle and the other people in the community to see how we can take the, the difficulties and trauma that people have experienced over the last couple of years and turning that into something that um, creates a kind of um, strengthening of our ability to interact with each other, our ability to de-escalate, our ability to find uh, healing solutions through um, you know, tragedy. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to Eric and then to Chriselle, and I look forward to the talk. Thank you, Jordan. And thank you to Becoming Machinic and Sortilage for sponsoring this talk. Half of the money for the sponsorship is going to Lena to support Lena operations and will help us to continue to organize events like this and programming and provide services to support our community. The other half will go to the Minnesota Peace Building Leadership Institute. If you're interested in being a sponsor for a future Lena talk, let us know. Nasise will put a link in the Zoom comments where you can leave your information. Tonight's Lena talk with Chris Shell is all about building peace and making our community better for everyone. Building peace is not an easy thing. It has been a challenge throughout history in America. It started with the land of the United States, where we all stand now. Before European settlers arrived, indigenous people inhabited this land. That land was taken from them after the Revolutionary War. The United States of America was born. Native Americans were removed from their ancestral homelands and put on reservations. Black people were brought over from Africa and became slaves. This is a painful history for America that has hurt a lot of people and created a lot of trauma. Martin Luther King, the famous civil rights leader, understood this historical trauma. He saw three evils in the world that permeated American society, the evil of racism, the evil of poverty, and the evil of war. And he often spoke about them in powerful speeches. On March 31st, 1968, he gave a speech at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., entitled, Remaining Awake Through a Great Revolution. It was one of the last speeches of his life, and he talked about the roots of racism in America. This is what Dr. King said, quote, 
1863, the Negro was told that he was free as a result of the Emancipation Proclamation being signed by Abraham Lincoln, but he was not given any land to make that freedom meaningful. It was something like keeping a person in prison for a number of years and suddenly discovering that that, that person is not guilty of the crime for which he was convicted. And you just go up to him and say, now you are free, but you don't give him any bus fare to get to town. You don't give him any money to get to some clothes to put on his back or to get on his feet again in life. Every court of jurisprudence would rise up against this. And yet this is the very thing that our nation did to the black man. It simply said, you're free. And it left him there penniless, illiterate, not knowing what to do. And the irony of it all is that at the same time, the nation failed to do anything for the black man. An act of Congress was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did it give the land, it built land grant colleges to teach them how to farm. Not only that, it provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, as the years unfolded, it provided low interest rates so that they could mechanize their farms. And to this day, thousands of these very persons are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies every year not to farm. And these are so often the very people who tell Negroes that they must lift themselves up by their own bootstraps. It's all right to tell a man to lift himself up by his own bootstraps, but it is a cruel jest to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. We must come to see that the roots of racism are very deep in our country. And there must be something positive and massive done in order to get rid of all the effects of racism and the tragedies of racial injustice." End quote. Martin Luther King spoke these words 53 years ago. They remain relevant, as relevant now as they did then. We need more peace in this world. That starts by creating peace at home. And many good people are committing to building more peace here in Minneapolis. Chriselle is one of those people her work with the Minnesota Peacebuilding Institute and in coming to the table is centered around racial healing and restorative justice training. How do we transform psychological trauma into nonviolent power? How do we acknowledge and heal from the racial wounds of the past, from slavery and the many forms of racism it produced? How can we work together to create a just and truthful society? Rochelle will answer these questions and explain what steps we can take to empower our community through racial healing and restorative justice so that others can learn how to use truth justice, mercy, and resilience to build peace in our communities and beyond. Rochelle is a community leader in Minneapolis, and we are happy to have her as our speaker for this Lena talk. Rochelle will speak for a few minutes about what steps we can take now to build peace in our community. Then she, uh, then she will take questions from the community. If you have any questions for Rochelle, please leave them in the Zoom comments, Facebook comments, or in a question form uh, Nisise will share in the Zoom chat. We'll have Rochelle answer as many questions from the community as she can. With that, I thank you all for being here, Chriselle. The stage is yours. Thank you so much. I just want to check in. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, wonderful. Thank you. I am I'm going to start sharing my screen for my presentation, and I'm going to turn my camera off um, while we present and so that we are able to um so that my connection just is stronger and then during the q a time i will um, come back on okay All right, I just want to check in, make sure everyone can see my screen all right. Okay, well, good evening, everyone. And thank you, um, Eric, for the lovely introduction. How, what power. Um, and thank you, Jordan, for sponsoring tonight's event. And thank you for all of those joining us live and the folks who are watching the recording of this event. I am absolutely delighted that we have the opportunity to spend a few moments together this evening discussing community truth, justice, and healing. And as we begin, um, I would just like to let you know that um, unfortunately, like I was sharing before, our community has been experiencing some electrical and internet issues for the past few days. 
So um, I will absolutely do my best to make sure that we have the strongest connection possible, which includes um, keeping my camera off. And I just opened up my chat so you all might be able to see that. Okay, perfect. I'm not gonna keep my chat open because I think it'll disrupt the visual. So I'd like to um, begin my talk tonight with a couple acknowledgements. Um, the land that my family lives on in Minnesota is traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. We reside on land that was cared for and called home by the Ojibwe people. Before them, the Dakota and Northern Cheyenne people and other native peoples from time immemorial. By offering this land acknowledgement, our family affirms tribal sovereignty, and we work to hold ourselves and community leaders accountable to um, American Indian peoples and nations. I also acknowledge that because of hundreds of years of enslavement of African people, including my own ancestors, this country and its citizens continue to benefit from the unpaid labor of these invisible founders, which is the economic foundation of this nation. So let me share a little bit about my organization, Peace Building. So Peace Building was founded by our executive director, Dr. Donna Minter. And our mission is to instigate, train, and support racially, sexually, culturally, ethnically, religiously, and economically diverse individuals and organizations to become trauma-informed, resilience-oriented, and restorative justice-focused. Empowering communities in Minnesota, the entire United States of America, and the world. We fulfill our mission by offering trainings related to understanding and healing psychological trauma, restorative justice, self-care and resilience, and emotional freedom technique for stress relief. We also offer custom trainings and talking circles. Since 2001, coming, peace building has been sharing trauma-informed, resilience-oriented, and restorative justice-focused strategies to build peace back into our lives. We, we also offer community events, such as coming to the table gatherings, which I'm gonna share a little bit about shortly, the monthly film, a monthly film series, and a racial justice book study. In 2010, Peace Building founder Donna brought strategies to trauma awareness and resilience training to Minnesota. And that's where she and I met. At the first STAR training, participants represented a cross-section of the United States, and we all found our place somewhere during that five days together. I'm still dear friends with several of the other trainees. The STAR training literally rose out of the ashes of the tragic events of September 11, 2001. A few days after 9-11, a major nonprofit in New York City, Church World Service, Call the Center for Justice and Peace Building at Eastern Mennonite University in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and asked faculty to develop a training for community leaders from the 9-11 impacted areas. They wanted an educational resource to help them learn how to address and heal psychological trauma without demonizing others. Church World Service gave the Center for Justice and Peace Building $2 million to develop STAR as a multicultural, multiracial, and multi-faith training that would be useful both in the United States as well as internationally. STAR was developed with three basic goals. Understand and address psychological trauma, break cycles of victimhood and violence, and build resilience at the individual, community, and societal levels with restorative justice strategies to transform psychological trauma into nonviolent power. STAR teaches not only about trauma healing and resilience, but it integrates these concepts and strategies with human security of basic needs, nonviolent conflict transformation, restorative justice, and broadly defined spirituality. Star understands spirituality as addressing the big questions in life, such as where does love come from? Where does power come from? What does it mean to belong? Some people use 
specific religious traditions to answer these questions. Others do not. STAR welcomes all. At STAR, trainees not only learn to be trauma-informed, they also learn how to build their resilience with restorative focused strategies that allow for healing and the possibility of reconciliation with those in their sphere of influence. During STAR, trainees discuss many types of psychological trauma and that effect on humans, including individual traumas, collective traumas, single event traumas, and ongoing continuous and cumulative trauma. We explore what happens in the brain and the body after a traumatic event. And we learn together how unhealed trauma affects the way we treat ourselves and each other. Here is our cycle of violence model. Beginning here, when trauma strikes, we virtually all have the same physiological reaction designated by the solid line but we can have very different emotional and mental reactions to the same traumatic experience when we become victims. This includes fantasies of revenge and a misguided attempt to address our basic human need for justice. When one's basic human need for justice is not met, it is, it is extremely easy for one to enter the aggressor cycle of violence. My apologies. Um, I think someone is writing on the screen. I'm sorry, I accidentally hit it. Oh, that's okay. Okay, perfect. I thought something was happening. All right. So let's continue. Um, when one's basic human need for justice is not met, it's extremely easy to enter into the aggressor side of the cycle of violence. When this happens, aggressors commonly see themselves as victims and embrace an us-them mentality. Their unmet need for safety and justice is misinterpreted as shame, humiliation, and fear. They commonly develop a good versus evil narrative. They can begin to dehumanize others with derogatory name calling, and many aggressors view violence as redemptive. They decide to pursue their own needs, even at the expense of others. They often um, easily respond to social and cultural pressures and pride, and then they can begin to create and sustain unjust structures and systems that exclude people. And sometimes they even do this in the name of self-defense, justice, and honor. So when aggressors act out in these ways, they actually create more victims, which then in turn creates more aggressors. And the cycle of violence continues on and on. And as the cycle spins on, acting out and acting in behaviors continue. Star believes that it does not have to be this way. Here is Star's breaking cycles of violence, building resilience model. At Star, we share strategies to break free from the cycles of violence and explore ways to acknowledge our experiences and engage in strategies that help us reconnect to self and others. By understanding what safety means to individuals and communities, we learn how to define, identify, and cultivate trusting and supportive relationships. Then we're able to practice self-regulation and co-regulation together, helping us to be leaders in our own lives and support healthy, healthy leadership in others, which in turn creates opportunities for us to make choices that support individuals and the community, and that equals healthy power. Now let's start exploring trauma and conflict. Trauma responses generate from many origins, um, historical, structure, structural, systemic, as well as interpersonal and individual experiences. Traumatic events impact bodies, brains, beliefs, and behaviors. And when we ignore them, it actually compounds the harm. Consider that pain that is not transformed is transferred. So trauma can lead to conflict. What is conflict? Conflict is an incompatibility between two or more persons or groups which may be real or perceived. Conflict may be latent. It can exist, but it's not expressed or overt. It can be, it can be expressed in actions or words. David Anderson Hooker says that conflict is simply two ideas 
he is trying to share the same space. Now let's consider what if we thought of conflict as energy? Conflict is not bad or harmful. It is if it is expressed and addressed constructively. Conflict that is expressed destructively helps um, keep us in, keeps us cycling in those cycles of violence that we saw earlier. This can lead to violence and abuse. Conflict that is expressed constructively can present opportunities for positive change. And conflict does not, um, is not the same as violence, unless that is how it expressed. Because many people have only seen conflict manifest as violence, it can bring, out, bring about a fear of engaging in conflict constructively, which looks like the fear of speaking out or even asking questions. So when we have conflict, there's often needs that we have. Um, we often have the need to feel safe, the need for justice and fairness, a need to repair harm, a need to repair relationships. We often want to uncover and address the root causes of the conflict. So when we channel conflict energy into creating new possibilities for perhaps meeting needs, including justice and healing, we're able to move away from silent, violent, and destructive conflict patterns. Engaging conflict Engaging conflicting parties with the intent to reestablish or establish relationships can lead us to changing systems and structures. Let's talk about those authentic justice needs. So when we have been harmed, some of our authentic needs for justice include safety, information, like who was involved, what happened, how did we arrive at this place, we often have a need for truth telling um, that helps us to validate our experiences and memorialize them. We have a authentic need for empowerment so that we can engage in um, our own level of participation, determine our own level of participation and make choices about the outcome. And finally, we want, often want to acknowledge and repair the harm which can lead to transformation of systems and structures that perpetuate harm and, um, against individuals and communities. Restorative justice is one of the ways to meet our authentic needs. When we engage in restorative processes, we allow accountability to happen and not in, without entering into the cycles of violence. Restorative justice is a philosophy that emphasizes healing and accountability to repair harm and wrongdoing, build community and strengthen relationships. Coming to the table dialogue, racial dialogue circle gives us the opportunity to address collective trauma relating to on, the collective ongoing and continuous and cumulative individual trauma we all experience because of the legacy of genocide and enslavement that we share. So I'd like to share a bit about coming to the table with you, which is um, a way to engage community in these dialogues, racial healing dialogues. So coming to the table um, began with the Harrison and Jefferson families. Both of those families had this, continue to have descendants that were um, Though of those who were enslaved and descendants of those that were um, that enslaved others. And so these two families decided to engage in conversation so that they could explore how the impact um, of the legacy of enslavement was still affecting their families today. So um, coming to the table is um, was developed at Eastern Mennonite University, the same place where strategies for trauma awareness and resilience was, um, was developed. And um, at coming to, at, excuse me, coming to the table is grounded in star concepts as well. So let's look a little bit more at coming to the table. So coming to the table approach um, is to achieve its mission and vision by being grounded in theories and practices of strategies for trauma awareness and resilience, STAR. 
We're focusing on transforming historical harms and their transgenerational transmission of trauma. We work towards racial justice and equity by using restorative lens and utilizing the circle process and touchstones, which are also guidelines, to create space in which participants feel safe enough and motivated to do the work. And we use these four interrelated practices. We use uncovering history, making connections, working towards healing, and taking action. So let's take a look at those um, different pra those practices a little bit more. So the four pillars of coming to the table include uncovering history, researching, acknowledging, and sharing personal, family, community, state, and national histories of race with openness and honesty, making connections, connecting to others within and across racial lines in order to develop and deepen relationships, we're working towards healing by exploring how we can heal together through dialogue, reunion, ritual, meditation, prayer, ceremony, the arts, apology, and other methods. And then taking action by actively seeking to dismantle systems of racial inequality, injustice, and oppression, and to work for the transformation of our nation. We do um, facilitate coming to the table gatherings using the circle process. Um, and an adaptation, I should say, of circle process. Circle process um, is a way of communicating and being in relationship with others deeply. And the practice um, comes from our indigenous brothers, sisters, and two-spirited folks from around the world. And the way that coming to the table uses um, the talking circle is by creating a space where we can all feel um, like we are on equal footing and we can honor one another. We sit in a circle together and we respond to queries using three simple rules. Um, a talking piece is passed around the circle. Only the person with the talking piece speaks and all the other, all others have the opportunity to listen. When we engage in listening with our hearts and speaking from our hearts, it really allows us um, to to take in what other people are wanting to share with us without having to worry about um, interruption or considering what we're gonna say next. It's always okay to pass when you're in circle and the circle keeper starts the process. They also participate in the circle and there's often a centering candle or um, something in the center of the circle to represent life and also um, the community that has gathered together. And our circles often begin and end with meaningful readings and rituals. And one of, and we also use um, touchstones. So touchstones are our guidelines of how we're gonna be together um, and with ourselves during our talking circle process. This helps us to create trusting and safe space, safe enough spaces where we can speak our truth. So I'm just going to briefly share our touchstone and um, in follow up documentation, we'll make sure that we get you website and um, additional information in case anyone wants to look up um, coming to the table and the touchstone. So we ask that we are be 100% present, extending and presuming welcome. We listen deeply to each other. We try it on, see how other people's um, words fit us and their experiences fit us. Everything coming to the table is always by invitation. We don't try to fix each other. We listen to um, what other people share and understand that that is their experience and their reality. Um, we identify our own assumptions and try to suspend our judgments, recognizing that we're all coming from a different place. We encourage everyone to speak their truth using I statements. We um, are aware of and allow for the difference between intention and impact of words. And we acknowledge uncomfortable responses with strategies such as oops, ouch, and educate. We respect silence. We ask that what is said in the circle remains in the circle. We also respect the differences in different places and ways of being um, that people have. 
we, when things get difficult, we encourage our members to turn to wonder, try both and rather than either or. And then we finally, we expect non-closure. We stay in the here and now and recognize that we probably won't get to the end of the road today. Um, I had a little video that I was gonna show, but I think um, I will email it and have it part as part of the documentation. So I just want to say thank you for um, having me tonight and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we can get into some Q and A. Great, uh, thank you, Michelle, for a nice presentation, it's excellent. Uh, so we have some questions from the community. Um, start with um, one right here. How can others join this peace building movement? That's a great question. So we offer um, a variety of trainings if you're interested. Um, and I will be sure again to put our trainings on our website on, in the documentation. And we up have um, the full STAR training is a 38 hour training. We have a one day training. We have several um, two hour trainings that kind of break STAR down into smaller pieces. Uh, and we also um, have four off the four coming to the table gatherings a month that anyone is able to come to. Um, they're free to come. You just we limit the number of people that can attend any given um, month and gathering just because it's a talking circle and we have 90 minutes. Um, but those also are found on our website. So we'll make sure that that is in the documentation. Uh, here's another one. What impact have you seen on the community in Minneapolis through Minnesota peace building and coming to the table talking circles? Mm, that is an excellent question. Thank you. So what I'll say for me personally, what I've seen is transformation. Um, I, we have at coming to the table, we've been offering these gatherings for about four years and almost five now actually um and what we've seen is people some people come you know once and then they never join us again but what we have now is a collection of people who um they either attend one or more of the gatherings a month and we are seeing um you know people being braver about the conversations they have they're coming back with stories around their successes and how they are um, bringing these topics up at major you know, holidays and events with their family. Um, we're learning language together. How do we describe and tune into what we're experiencing and how we're feeling um, and where you know, racism and white supremacy show up for us in our bodies. Um, and then on a, a, that's on an individual level, on a community level, we've had many organizations within the Twin Cities um, and beyond actually provide, like bring us in to train their whole staff. And then an entire you know, organization is trauma informed and working to implement restorative practices in their organization. It's been amazing work. Um, and, and I think that our communities are just so much more aware of the need for trauma healing and, and understanding. And so we are, there are lots of people engaging um, right now. That's great. Uh, what do you think is the biggest community challenge or challenges Minneapolis faces today? Mm. You know, the Twin Cities and Minneapolis, I mean, we have, so many resources here in our community. Um, we have people that are healers and um, you know they are doing the work. And to me, one of the biggest challenges is just not knowing who's who's available, like what what work is being done in our community. Um, that's really one of the biggest things that I see as a challenge because we have we have I, yeah, we have a lot of people who we get to intersect with and yeah, it's amazing. Well, here's a question from Lewis Cohen. 
Is there a common issue that is held, shared, and discussed? In coming to the table gatherings? Yes. So we offer two types of gatherings every month. Um, we have two gatherings that are what we call learning circles. And um, we meet on Saturday mornings and Monday evenings. And for those two learning circles, we um, generally talk about some systemic trauma or some um, system that we live in. So right now we are exploring the characteristics of white supremacy. And we've been doing that for all of 2021. Um, and then in the other type of circle, it's a talking healing circle. And we, the Peace Building started sponsoring those circles because after Mr. Floyd was murdered, um, community asked for an additional space to just talk about what they're experiencing um, in, you know, related to Mr. Floyd's murder, the trials, and also um, other police killings in the Twin Cities and beyond. So um, those are our two themes right now. And we are always um, looking for people who are interested in coming to the, starting coming to the table gatherings in their neighborhoods. And we can, you can really, coming to the table is a flexible process. So you can really focus on whatever you want. What are some of the challenges or what are the biggest challenges to the work you do with Minnesota Peace Building and coming to the table? <laughs> you know, honestly, it's just um, getting people to the table. Many people aren't comfortable discussing, you know, topics like trauma and our shared history of genocide and enslavement. And so, you know, really normalizing these conversations um, I think is one of the biggest challenges. Do you have an example or to share of, of restorative justice and action and, and how it was affected? Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, I was a community member at a restorative practice, restorative justice conference for a juvenile. And um, it was, I was one of three, I believe, community members. It was the facilitator, the juvenile who was, I believe, a junior in high school and his mom. And we sat down at that first gathering um, and, you know, we all talked together. And as we sat there, I could just really sense him um, feeling small. And so I, you know, just said encouraging words to him, like, you know, thanks for being here and thank you for speaking the truth and, you know, just sharing with him about how, um, how important it was for me as a community member to be there to support him. And, um, you know, as he, as we talked and other community members started sharing similar sentiments, he, his whole physical body changed um, and he began to just have a different presence in the room. And then the next time we met um, to just follow up with his, um, with making sure he followed through with everything that he agreed to, he just talked about how like that meeting really changed his perception of himself and others. And he even um, started mentoring his little brother more um, because he had sort of cut off that relationship. And so just recognizing my restorative justice offers us an opportunity to really re, you know, build connection. Me and this young man had no connection before but build connection between us and also within us. Um, because when we are accepted back into community, it is, it's impactful. It means something to us because we're meant to be connected as humans. So I think that was one of like, yeah, one of the most powerful changes that I saw. That's great. Um, along those lines, you know, how can we, 
do an effective job of promoting peace with young people? Is there anything schools or community programs could do to help kids learn the tools to, to begin building peace and promoting peace? That's a great question. Um, well, one thing I think that we underestimate youth right now, they are, they're all about this work. Um, they are taking care of themselves, they're speaking up, they're learning to use their voices in ways that um, previous generations, I don't think, had the ability or access to do. And in terms of, in terms of, um, you know, programming, I mean, having, engaging in circle process with um, young people can be a powerful way for them to really learn about themselves and how they want to show up in the world. The power of circle and being able to share and speak without interruption is something that many young people don't have the opportunity to have. So starting a circle with young people, listening to their ideas, reinforcing you know, their commitment to be a part of community and how important that is, and go from there. They have great ideas. Um, here's another question. Individuals obviously can be traumatized. Can an organization as a whole be in a place of trauma response? Are there tools to aid organizations? Yes. Um, an organization, it really any system can be traumatized. What that might look like as an example um, in a workplace is Consider when there is um, a, a big change in leadership, especially a change after um, maybe things have been like a, a layoff or um, maybe industry being affected. And so the individuals may be afraid for their jobs. They may, you know, a consultant may come in. And so all of that, um, all of that impacts each individual, but also the community culture as a whole. And so the community, the, the entire organization can have a trauma response. And um, at STAR, we do talk about organizations and how to deal with that trauma response. And it's very similar to what we do with individuals, you know, create spaces of safety within the organization, help people um, like, understand and be present in the moment and find out what their needs are. Um, us, you know, find ways to help the group self-regulate so that, that if they are activated, um, they can all know very similar strategies and practices. And then creating opportunities for leadership and voice um, in, the, in the organization. So yes, um, Joe, organizations as a whole can be traumatized. Mm -hmm. Some people today feel, feel a lot of anger or pain or hurt and, and they might question peace and the idea of peace and they might not, they, they don't think it's effective. What would you say to, to people about why we need peace building and peace? Well, I will say that um, I just want to be clear, like this work is about inviting people in to do it. And so there are people who are not ready to be a part of peacemaking strategies, organizations, and that's their choice. Um, no one should be forced into this work. This work is work that people um, that people, when they're open to it, is very powerful and sometimes um, can be rejected if they're not ready. So um, in terms of other folks, you know, how, how do we, why is it important? Well, as those cycles of violence shared show, like we as humans have some basic responses physiological responses to being traumatized. And they're all in us and it doesn't matter um, what you look like on the outside. 
And when we experience trauma, we have for very good reason, reactions, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. They're very, they're normal, um, but we also can get confused. And sometimes we begin to hurt ourselves and others. And, you know, when we engage in strategies to help us break free from those trauma reactions, there's just less violence. And I don't, you know, I hope most people don't want to in, be stuck in those cycles of violence and some will, and that's part of the process as well. When acknowledging Juneteenth, can you go into details about what is appropriate and what is not? Mm, can you say more? Uh, that's all that, that they wrote for the question. Well, I mean, that's a kind of a vague question, partially because what's appropriate and what's not depends on who you are and where you are and community standards. So um, if someone writes in and shares more detail, I'd be happy to go into it or at least give my opinion. Yeah, I, I believe that question was filed uh, or shared earlier. Um, okay. No worries. No worries. So, um, here's another one. How do you think local business development can be utilized to integrate communities and neighborhoods, especially areas of Minneapolis that have been historically segregated? Hmm. Well, I think, I mean, there are many ways, right? Like different levels. On an individual level, um, that is easy to do is get out and be in community you know i know that in minnesota we only have like six months of weather where we may be able to be outside but set up a table invite people in go to local high schools and find you know engage children in um internships like there are many ways for us to engage with each other that build community especially when we have resources like a small business. Here's another question. How can communities provide ongoing relationship engagement, leadership, resources, and a supportive environment to dismantle racism? So listening to people within the organization understanding what their needs are, especially if you have um, marginalized voices within your organization. Um, also, bringing in, you know, people to help understand where your organization is, you know, maybe do some strategic planning around that. Um, and finally, have people attend, you know, STAR or, you know, you can always um, have your have folks sign up for coming to the table. In fact, our Friday, um, our fourth Friday coming to the table, we um, added that one specifically because it was in the middle of the day. So it's from 12 until 1.30 Central Standard Time. So that people, if they um, would like to, during their work day, come and have those dialogues. So there's lots of um, options and opportunities and I would say, listen to the people in the organization. What are some useful approaches to self-care that people can do on a daily basis? Are there any simple techniques for resilience? Absolutely. Um, treating your bodies with um, respect. So getting enough sleep drinking enough water, eating whole food, getting exercise, giving yourself the opportunity to have fun and play and experience authentic joy, spending time with family and friends um, and people that love you, care about you and you care about them, um, laughing really hard, allowing your body to experience a full belly laugh is so powerful. Um, you know, color, draw, create as maybe 
you used to do as a child, um, or maybe when you didn't have so much responsibility, engage in those three things that we can do every day. Um, engage in those three things, yeah, they just, it helps to build your resilience and helps you to, helps your brain literally to continue um, thinking fully without just being reactive. Well, we have time for one more question. Uh, how did you become involved in this important work? What drives you to do the work that you do? Mm, I, um, yeah, I took the first STAR training that Donna offered in 2010. Um, at that time, I was working in um, the legal profession, and I was seeing a lot of trauma. And I wanted to make sure that I was informed enough and equipped to handle um, the clients that we were seeing. And so I took STAR and it was unlike anything that I had ever taken. And I decided that um, I wanted to continue to learn more. And so Donna um, called me, said, yep, we're gonna do this again. And I continued working with her until um, 2012, which when she asked me to become a trainer, and um, I became a trainer, and so I've been a trainer since 20, I think my first training was actually 2013, and now I'm the assistant executive director, um, and so like that a path in a short, um, in a short dis description, but I think that um, what keeps me here is really understanding that we all live in systems and these systems affect the way that we treat ourselves and each other. And if we want to, to engage with each other differently, then we have to change the system. And since systems are made up of people, I decided that um, if I get engaged with people, then I could change systems. And so that's what I do. And it's every day is not, you know, it's not easy, right? But I take the long view that over time, um, we will have a better world for all of us and not in like the rose colored glasses sense, but through hard work and dedication and perseverance and intentionality, we will have a better future in this country. I agree. I agree, Michelle. And thank you um, for this talk. It was great. I um, just want to um, also say that a key to peace building is building community. Follow up with what Michelle is saying and said, evening. we need to keep working together in positive ways to find solutions. Some of the big problems we face. Our Lena Talks series are one way. Lena, Larry Hill East Neighborhood Association is helping build community. We also are planning a Lena Community Festival at Mueller Park on October 2nd from 12 to 4 p.m. It's a Saturday and the festival will be free and family friendly with a coloring contest that brings together local businesses, artists, and neighborhoods to participate in a day of food, music, community building, and drawing and coloring. The coloring contest will be open to different age groups from younger than kindergartners to kids of all ages up to single digits or up to triple digits, um, over a hundred. So we like people to stay young at heart and all are welcome to participate in our day of community. We'll have prizes and lots of fun. This is our first public announcement of the festival, but there will be many more. So please help us spread the word and we hope to see you all at uh, our Lena Community Festival on October 2nd at Mueller Park. Bringing people together for a community festival is another way to help build peace. Many other neighborhood associations and community-based organizations throughout Minneapolis are doing positive things to bring the community together in the interest of our collective social and public welfare. We need more people in every community, young and old, to continue to work together to create a community that works for everyone. It won't be easy to build peace and solve difficult problems, but it's worth the effort. And if we get enough people behind solutions and moving in the right direction, we can achieve more peace in Minneapolis and beyond.
I want to thank Chris Hill again for being our speaker for this great Lena talk tonight. I also want to thank Jordan Peacock and Bekimon Machinic and Sortilage for sponsoring it. And I want to thank everyone who joined us in the audience for participating in this Lena talk. If you know anyone who wasn't able to join us, let them know the talk was recorded and will be available for viewing in the future at their convenience on the Lena website and on the Lena Facebook page. Our next Lena talk will be Wednesday, September 22nd at 7 p.m. with Princess Haley. Princess is the co-founder and senior engagement officer at Appetite for Change, a nonprofit organization based in North Minneapolis that focuses on food justice issues and the food system in Minneapolis. Princess will be giving a talk on how food impacts local health, wealth, and social change. Princess will discuss her work at Appetite for Change, their programming and community outreach, and the impact the organization is making in terms of improving diets, getting people access to fresh local food, food education, job creation, economic growth, business development, policy change, community well-being, and social connectedness. We hope to see you at our September Lena talk with Princess Haley. Until then, please keep supporting local businesses wherever you are, keep showing up for local events, and keep giving back to the community. Putting positive energy and actions into our community, your community, wherever you live, is how we can strengthen communities and helping our community grow and achieve peace. Thank you all again. Wish you all a good night and peace to all of you.